Happy Veterans Day. We at the Norman Rockwell Museum are grateful for your dedicated service and sacrifice. And I am honored to be a part of National Museum of Marine Corps programming today. Um, many thanks to Marine Corps artist and residence Chris Battles and also to Elise McKelvey for inviting me to join you for this exciting symposium focusing on the contributions of combat artists, exceptionally talented practitioners who use the power of visual reportage to tell personal stories inspired by their experiences with the armed forces. It's my pleasure to represent the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is dedicated to the art of illustration in all its variety, featuring a collection of 850 original Norman Rockwell artworks, an extensive archive, and the artist Stockbridge Studio, which is open for visitation on our site. And there you are actually seeing Norman Rockwell's home in downtown Stockbridge. Uh, that's the White Colonial on the left-hand side. And the studio that's now on our grounds is seen to the right. Rockwell is actually seen inside uh, on his princess telephone, uh, which actually was the first um, directly connected telephone in Stockbridge. We also hold almost 25,000 works by other illustrators, both historical and contemporary. And I'm happy to share that our Exhibitions have brought Rockwell and illustration to audiences throughout the nation and the world, raising awareness of the power of this persuasive art form, which is sometimes hidden in plain sight. As you are well aware, the history of artists working in the field is long, spanning the Revolutionary War to today's global engagements. Before we get to Norman Rockwell's unconventional experiences in the Navy during World War I, we'll take a quick look at some highlights to provide some historical background on combat art. Despite the growing efficiency of cameras in the 19th century, photography on the battlefield was difficult due to long exposures and cumbersome equipment. Because of this, Civil War illustrator reporters like Winslow Homer, Alfred Woud, and Edwin Forbes were engaged by Harper's, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, and other publications to capture events and action that photography at the time could not. Even in the 20th century, as photographic technology advanced, Wartime illustrators remained in demand as skillful practitioners, they were able to prioritize aspects of chaotic situations and assemble compelling visual evidence to communicate complex events simultaneously and with empathy and emotion. Official war artists have been a part of the American military since 1917. After the United States entry into World War I, the War Department called upon the Division of Pictorial Publicity to stimulate support for the Allied cause. Illustrator Charles Dana Gibson, who created the Gibson Girl and was at the time the president of the New York Society of Illustrators, acted as art director to oversee more than 700 poster designs. He also handpicked eight volunteer illustrators to accompany and document the American Expeditionary Forces, nicknamed the Eight. These included William J. Elward, Wallace Morgan, and Harvey Dunn, among others, commissioned to document the US Army's role in the war. They were first stationed in the rear, far from the fighting, but Dunn urged Army command to let his contingent go to the front lines. Commissioned as a, cap a captain in the Engineer Reserve Corps, Dunn was 33 years old and had no previous military training. Stationed in France, he brought along a sketch box of his own design fitted with drawing paper on a cylindrical scroll that allowed him to move more easily from one drawing to the next. Attached to Company A of the 167th Infantry, he faced fire himself 
and recorded the men's struggles and casualties firsthand. These pressures left little time to finish work or send art back to the United States for publication as intended. Artists expected to have time to paint and draw from their rough sketches once retired from duty, but after the armistice, the military's interest in the project waned. Discharged in April of 1919, Dunn returned home on the USS North Carolina and would ultimately complete 33 paintings based upon his wartime experiences. Rather than focusing only on the drama of soldiers in action that had been envisioned by the military, Dunn faithfully recorded a full spectrum of emotions and experiences in his art. In 1928, he completed several of his war, war compositions for the American Legion Monthly, which published his dramatic portrayals inspired by firsthand experience on its covers. Um, this is actually an example of uh, Harvey Dunn's sketch box, uh, although I could not get a picture of the scroll, which I had uh, really hoped to do. During World War II, the US military supported artists on all fronts in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. Commissioned and trained as soldiers, they were encouraged to capture everything from the most devastating to the mundane. And more than 2000 works were created. In 1943, Life Magazine covered the war when the military art program lost its congressional funding and deactivated war art. Life engaged sidelined artists to travel with the armed forces to capture combat experiences for the magazine. Recently on view in the Museum's Four Freedoms exhibition, which traveled throughout the nation and to Normandy, France for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, Thomas Lee's The 2000 Yard Stare from the collection of the United States Army Center of Military History in Washington, DC is one powerful example. The painting was inspired by Lee's experiences as an artist and war correspondent with the 1st Marine Division in the Battle of Palau in September, 1944. Compassion for soldiers is nearly universal in war art. And here we are face to face with a traumatized battle fatigued soldier who has been deeply affected by the war raging behind him. The painting portrays a war weary soldier whom Lee met after the fight on Bloody Nose Ridge, one of Japan's most staunchly defended redoubts on the Western Pacific Island. The 2000 yard stare describes the appearance of soldiers who have been forced to detach themselves from the trauma of their firsthand experiences with violent combat. After Lee's painting was published in Life, in June 1945, the image became synonymous with the phrase and the residual effects of war on the human psyche. Abbott Laboratories, which provided pharmaceuticals and medical supplies uh, to the armed forces during World War II, sponsored artist correspondent Kurt Eby to travel with the US Marines in the Pacific. A pacifist, E.B. created some of the most stirring work of the period. Ebb Tide, a charcoal drawing, communicates a sense of devastation even before the viewer perceives the figures lying motionless in the water. Newspaper illustrator Howard Brody documented the war for the San Francisco Chronicle and worked for Yank Magazine in both Europe and the Pacific. After the war, Brody became a courtroom artist and returned to the battlefields of Korea, Indochina, and Vietnam. The Army newspaper Stars and Stripes featured the work of Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Bill Malden, whose characters Willie and Joe portrayed soldiers with a sense of dark humor that pro proved to be popular with his appreciative audiences. Thank you. 
Moving on to the artist at hand, Norman Rockwell was America's most prominent 20th century illustrator, revered by his public and reviled by many in the art world, but his paintings were made to last. Created for the covers and pages of our nation's periodicals rather than for the walls of galleries and museums, Rockwell's images were immediately understood by a vast and eager audience who saw the best in themselves reflected in his art and in the stories he chose to tell. On the screen is actually one of his most iconic works, Triple Self Portrait, where Rockwell uh, places himself within the context of art history with some of his famous painters pinned up on his canvas on the right hand side, uh, Albrecht Durer, uh, Rembrandt, of course, Picasso and Van Gogh. And uh, of course, he does what every great self portrait does, um, make the sitter look even better. Rockwell's intricate, intricately conceived narratives imbued ordinary activities with a sense of historical importance, seizing the moment almost as it was about to fade. Replaced at the turn of a page by a succession of magazine issues and illustrations he called the history of European art into play, employing classical painting methodology to weave contemporary tales inspired by everyday people and places. A cast of affable, exquisitely painted characters and a plethora of supporting details kept him and his audience engaged and inspired belief by millions in the uniquely American vision that he conceived and continued to refine. Um, in the study on the right for art critic, uh, that is actually posed for by his wife, Mary. And the young man was posed for by his oldest son, Jarvis. And of course, Rubens serves as a great inspiration for the portrait. In 1943, a Time magazine reporter noted that Rockwell constantly achieves the compromise between a love of realism and the tendency to idealize, which is one of the most deeply ingrained characteristics of the American people. When America entered World War I in 1917, Norman Rockwell was already an established illustrator who regularly contributed cover and story illustrations to magazines like the Saturday Evening Post, Life, and the Literary Digest. As, a nation mobilized its re as, as, as the nation mobilized its resources, Rockwell's work changed to reflect the growing war effort. He portrayed soldiers and sailors who were strong, tough, and eager to serve in the military. In his artwork, they cheerfully signed up and enjoyed the camaraderie that formed in the armed forces. Rockwell's covers depicted Americans willingly making sacrifices to defend democracy at home and overseas, an idea that government officials wished to encourage. George M. Cohen composed Over There in 1917, shortly after the United States entered the war. The song was an astounding success and quickly became the official anthem for American troops serving overseas. The sheet music sold more than 2 million copies before the war was over, and it happened to carry a Norman Rockwell illustration on the cover. And you can see that illustration on the sheet music on the left hand side and on the right, the same uh, illustration on the cover of Life magazine, which at the time was a humor magazine. During World War I, Rockwell was initially exempted from the draft due to his status as sole provider for his family, including his wife, Irene, and his parents, Anne Nancy and Jarvis Rockwell. Later on, though, he felt guilty about staying home and decided to enlist in the Navy. Rockwell referred to himself as, quote, a lump, a long, skinny nothing, a bean pole without the beans. That's what I am, he said. One day in June in 1918, as I was riding uptown on the subway, 
Six or eight badly wounded merchant seamen boarded the train. I gave one of them my seat, he remembered. All I could think about as he lowered himself clumsily into the seat was how easily I'd got out of it. Of the careless way I rocked on my feet with the motion of the train. By the time I left the train at New Rochelle, New York, I'd made up my mind and I took a taxi to Pelham Bay Naval Training and Receiving Center, which you actually see here. But when he showed up at the Navy and the Navy Enlistment Center, he had one problem. He was 17 pounds underweight by Navy standards. According to his autobiography, the examining doctor offered to sign Rockwell's enlistment papers if he could gain seven pounds. As the artist tells it, with the doctor's approval, he gorged himself on donuts, bananas, and water until he gained the necessary weight. And this is actually a drawing that Rockwell did for his 1960 autobiography, My Adventures as an Illustrator, where he tells this story. A few days later, he was called to duty as a landsman for quartermaster, a grand title that uh, he thought of very proudly, but later discovered that it was really a term for a quote, a sailor of little experience rated below an ordinary seaman. Rockwell was stationed at the Charleston Navy Yard in South Carolina and quickly realized that he was not well suited to military life. Upon his enlistment, he was first assigned to paint camouflage patterns on ships due to his experience as an artist. And I'll share here, uh, these are actually Rockwell's uh, enlistment papers. And you can see that um, on the right hand side, he actually declares that he works for himself. Uh, he has some experience with small sail and motor boats and that he completed two years of high school, which is actually true. Uh, he went to Mamaroneck High School uh, in New York, and he uh, actually, after sophomore year, decided to go to art school. Uh, this is a wonderful cartoon from Afloat and Ashore, and uh, which is the assignment that he was uh, then given. And Afloat and Ashore was actually the official newspaper of the Charleston Naval Training Camp. As Rockwell tells it, he was given 10 days leave to go to New York to purchase art supplies. So I guess it was not a very difficult detail. And uh, this cartoon, I think, really reflects Rockwell's wonderful personal humor, uh, showing the different ways that people see this sailor and the way that he actually sees himself. Serving during the last four months of the war, Rockwell was even given permission to continue working for commercial magazines as long as his illustrations related in some way to military service. In addition to his official duties, Rockwell painted portraits of officers and in return, they would grant him passes into town or other special privileges. When Commander Mark St. Clair Ellis took over as commander of the Navy Yard, Rockwell was transferred to his personal staff to paint portraits of the commander and his wife. And you see the portrait of uh, the Naval officer here. I'm sorry, this is actually uh, a previous portrait that he created, but here is uh, St. Ellis. The command the Commandant of the Charleston Navy Yard and his staff lived aboard the USS Hartford, a plush floating, floating barracks that had once been Admiral David Farragut's flagship during the Civil War. Rockwell lived aboard the Hartford for about two months and described the Hartford as a sumptuous palace with elaborate furnishings, expert cooks, and a marine band for entertainment. Despite this, Rockwell's Navy record shows that his service lasted 
for less than four months. He enlisted on July 31st, 1918, and was discharged for, quote, ineptitude on November 19th, 1918. His service record reads, Rockwell is an artist and unaccustomed to hard manual labor. When he arrived in New Rochelle, New York, following his discharge, he said, I walked straight home, slung my sea bag in the closet, kissed Irene, and rushed out to look at my studio. And uh, actually in this uh, illustration, Sailor Dreaming, for the Saturday Evening Post, Irene's portrait uh, is right down below uh, being held by the sailor. This soldier might well have represented Rockwell himself as one who rushed enthusiastically back to his easel following his 1918 discharge from the service. The armistice that ended World War I took effect on November 11th, 1918, but the war was not officially over until the major participants signed the Treaty of Versailles in June, 1919. Even after that, American troops remained overseas as late as 1923 while serving in the post-war occupation of Germany. Some soldiers did not return home until years after fighting had ceased, and scenes like this one occurred all over America well into the 1920s. After the war, Rockwell completed this painting to advertise one of the benefits of military service. The training a soldier received in the army would give him practical skills that could be used to get a job when he returned to civilian life. And in fact, um, this painting on the left is in the Norman Rockwell Museum's permanent collection, which is wonderful. You see an actual advertisement in which it appeared on the right. And what they are actually touting is that if you are unhappy with your current profession, you can actually get a fresh start by joining the army and receiving uh, training for various trades. So it was an interesting uh, perspective that they were delivering there. One of the most difficult problems in painting magazine covers is thinking up ideas which a majority of readers will understand, Rockwell said. In wartime, the problem vanishes. Everyone in the country is thinking along the same lines. The war penetrates into everyone's life. The boy next door joins up, sugar can't be bought, for blood or money and war bond posters are plastered all over town in his experience. Take the post cover I did at the end of World War II of a soldier coming home, which is the one you see here. That scene was being repeated all over the United States in big Eastern cities, in the country towns of the Middle West, in Dallas, Seattle, Peoria, and Montana. I could be pretty sure that nobody would scratch their heads and say, now what is that soldier standing about in the backyard for? In 1939, Rockwell moved from New Rochelle, New York, where he had lived for 27 years, to Arlington, Vermont. And after a 1943 fire destroyed his studio complete with costume references, props, and much more, including original artworks, he reevaluated his choice of subjects as well. Rockwell had always wanted to be topical and record the current scene, and now his artistic path was fixed. During World War II, distant from the activities of the war raging in Europe, those in service to our country were once again the focal point of Rockwell's art. Rockwell's only image of a soldier in battle designed to stimulate ammunition production at munitions factories during World War II, featured a powerful machine gunner in the poster, let's give him enough and on time. Um, interestingly, when he was working on this piece and you see him there on the left uh, in his studio, Vermont studio, uh, 
he requested to have an actual machine gun uh, brought to his studio by the army. It was accompanied by two soldiers and he asked if the gun could be soiled to appear as though the soldier were in battle. And as Rockwell tells it, uh, he was advised that it could not because the uh, importance of maintaining one's equipment was um, very paramount, paramount. But he was able to uh, tear and soil the uniform of the model who posed. Um, so some interesting background there. It's a very powerful work, but Rockwell wanted to do more for the war effort and decided to illustrate Franklin D. Roosevelt's Four Freedoms Ideals presented during the president's January 1941 address to Congress, in which he was explaining to the American people uh, why it would be so significant to uh, step up and support world democracy. Finding new ideas for paintings never came easily, but this was a greater challenge. While considering his approach, Rockwell, by chance, attended a town meeting where a Vermont neighbor was met with respect when he rose among his neighbors to voice an unpopular view. And you see that on the far left in freedom of speech. That night he awoke with the realization that he could best paint the four freedoms from the perspective of his own experiences, using everyday scenes to illuminate Roosevelt's abstract ideals. Rockwell made some sketches and accompanied by fellow Saturday Evening Post artist Mead Schaefer, went to Washington to propose them. Unfortunately, the timing was wrong. The Ordnance Department did not have the resources for another commission. Disappointed, Rockwell stopped at Curtis Publishing Company in Philadelphia, which you see here, uh, on his way home, and he presented his concept to Post Editor Ben Hibbs. Hibbs immediately made plans to publish the illustrations, giving Rockwell permission to interrupt his cover work for a period of three months. He got, as he said, a bad case of stage fright though, and it was more than two months before he even began the project. It was so darn high blown, Rockwell said, somehow I just couldn't get my mind around it. Despite his early misgivings, the paintings were a phenomenal success. After their publication, the magazine received thousands of requests for reprints, and in May 1943, the Post and the US Department of the Treasury announced a joint campaign to sell war bonds and stamps, capitalizing on Rockwell's vision. And on the far left, you're actually seeing Norman Rockwell signing uh, prints of the Four Freedoms at Hex Department Store in Washington, DC, which is where um, a 16 city tour, uh, Four Freedoms War Bonds tour began and cities were actually in competition with each other to raise the most money. But these prints were given as premium premiums when someone purchased war bonds. However, Hex was the only um, location that Rockwell ever uh, went to. And uh, he then went back to his studio to continue his work. Rockwell even received praise from his friend and fellow artist Walt Disney, who was particularly fond of freedom of worship. Uh, and after their publication, the magazine received thousands of requests for reprints. Um, I'll just mention that there is a letter on the right hand side from Disney to Norman Rockwell dated May 21st, 1943. Um, Rockwell had sent Walt Disney the painting that you see here. It's called Girl Reading the Post. It's a 1941 Saturday Evening Post cover. And he basically uh, is writing to thank Rockwell for uh, that piece, which uh, he had hung in his office and which he said his staff was traipsing up to see. And uh, if you can look a little closely down at the bottom of the painting, there's an inscription that Rockwell made to Walt Disney and it says, to Walt Disney, one of the really great artists from an admirer, Norman Rockwell. And uh, 
Disney actually was particularly fond of freedom of worship, and he basically states that in this letter. He says, I, I thought uh, your four freedoms were great. And um, he also mentions a publication that he had created or begun creating for um, the soldiers of World War II and um, describes that a bit to Rockwell as well. So it's a jam-packed letter. Roosevelt's words and Rockwell's imagery soon became inseparable in the public consciousness with millions of reproductions bringing the four freedoms directly into American homes and workplaces. Though he was born in New York City and worked in New Rochelle, New York for many years, the paintings of Rockwell's Vermont years more than any others comprise the indelible images that forged Rockwell's identity as an American artist. Works like The Four Freedoms and Mother and Son Peeling Potatoes, which you see here, created the Rockwell brand. For the Saturday Evening Post Thanksgiving cover of 1945, Rockwell had planned to portray a group of people giving thanks. With the end of the war in sight, however, he decided instead to paint a soldier's homecoming. His subject seems happy to peel potatoes in the warmth of his admiring mother's kitchen, a task that would have been less pleasant in the army. Though still in uniform, he has slipped back into civilian shoes and is seated on a chair that appears almost child size, perhaps a remnant of years past. Rockwell's unassuming fictional GI named Willie Gillis told the story of one man's army in a series of popular Saturday evening post covers. He depicted Willie engaged in mundane tasks like receiving a care package from home, peeling potatoes, or reading the hometown news. The artist met his Willie Gillis model, Robert Otis Buck, at an Arlington, Vermont square dance. Then 15 years of age, Buck was still too young to fight, but he eventually began his service in 1943 as a naval aviator in the South Seas. Uh, this is interesting because um, you see Buck on the left-hand side. And uh, after Buck left for his service, Rockwell relied on photographs of Buck to continue his Willie Gillis series. And on the right-hand side, you see a piece called The Fighting Gillises, which portrays uh, all the members of the Willie Gillis family uh, in various wars. And there are some humorous titles uh, down at the bottom. And uh, they were so convincing that Rockwell received letters as to where those books could be found. The name Willie Gillis was coined by Rockwell's wife, Mary Barstow Rockwell, an avid reader who drew inspiration from the story of Wee Gillis, a 1938 book about an orphan boy by Munro Leaf. The first Willie Gillis cover appeared on October 4th, 1941. That was the care package that we showed you. While the last emerged after the war, when the familiar character enrolled in college on the GI Bill. Published widely, Willie Gillis enlargements were distributed by the USO, ultimately appearing in USO clubs at home and abroad, as well as in numerous railway stations and bus terminals. In this unpublished work featuring Willie Gillis being transported by convoy truck, Rockwell brought the war more explicitly into view. Realistically, rather than heroically portrayed, soldiers nap, smoke, and eat during transport, while wide-eyed Gillis, wearing a rabbit's foot around his neck, stares dreamily into the distance. This youthful character's innocence may have contrasted too greatly with the older, more experienced troops who understood what lay ahead. In the decades following World War II, America and Rockwell's reflection of it were changing. The population swell of the baby boom, the changing role of women in society, racial strife, and the pro proliferation of nuclear weapons forced us to see our world and ourselves in a different light. 
1966, Rockwell was commissioned to create a military recruitment poster, but he felt conflicted about the war in Vietnam. In March 1967, he wrote to the Marine Corps to decline the assignment. I just can't paint a picture unless I have my heart in it, he said. One year later, Rockwell began work on the right to know, a political statement expressing the right of citizens to be informed of the rationale behind their government's actions. Just months before the painting was to be published, the New York Times reported on the Pentagon Papers a scandal involving the White House's suppression of information regarding troop escalation in Vietnam. In this color study, Rockwell's subject's eyes are cast downward, but in the final, as you just saw, they look directly out at the viewer. For six decades, Rockwell inspired Americans by helping them to see the best in themselves. When he shifted his attention to significant social concerns, he faced an audience ready to receive his messages. In 1977, President Gerald R. Ford honored Rockwell with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest peacetime award, for having portrayed the American scene with unrivaled freshness and clarity and with insight, optimism, and good humor. With the onset of dementia and the effects of emphysema resulting from years of pipe smoking, Rockwell could no longer do the work that had so completely and passionately driven his life. In 1978, the artist died at home at the age of 84. Through the decades, the art of illustration has looked deeply into society reflecting and shaping a rapidly changing world. Rockwell's warm, admiring portrayals of soldiers over time, published by the millions, have made their way into the hearts and minds of Americans who appreciate, as he did, their extraordinary and selfless service to their country and to humanity. Thank you so much for having me today. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at splunkett at nrm.org and have a wonderful Veterans Day. Thank you.